Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Allen, Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and everybody thank our new patrons, Chris and Cody. On this episode of DTNS, Jen Briney updates us on right to repair. Plus, fiber gets new life in the U.S., hopefully. And Ron Richards joins us to talk Android 15, the good, the bad, and the in-between. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 5th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And from Long Island, I'm Ron Richards. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ron Richards, so good to have you back with us. Um, how's life? Back. Life is busy. It's good. The world, the world of Android has definitely kept me on my toes this summer. It's, it's, it's been, it has not been a quiet summer uh, with all the Google and the Android and the Samsung and the OnePlus and everybody in the world. So and it's, it, really, it, it really has been a, a non, not, not uh, slow summer. For tech it, news. It, it has been relentless, uh, I would say, because <laughs> I always look for like, oh, this is the week where we can have like a fun show and do a lot of emails on the podcast or whatever. But it's nope. just like a uh, new phone announced, new thing announced, new over and over and over again. But hey, it keeps us in business. I'll take it. So. <laughs> Indeed. And we will talk about a lot of that Android stuff with you in just a few. But let's start the show with the quick hits. The Bluetooth Special Interest Group, or SIG, released version 6.0 of Bluetooth. This is the first major version since Bluetooth 5 was launched back in 2016. New features include reducing power consumption, telling devices whether another device moves out of range to save energy, and also something called Bluetooth channel sounding, getting a lot of attention, enhancing security and better accuracy in location finding with centimeter level accuracy over considerable distances. The Biden administration announced actions to stop a Russian government-backed effort to influence the 2024 U.S. presidential election. On Wednesday, the White House launched criminal charges against two Russian nationals, seized 32 internet domains, and posed sanctions against 10 individuals and entities associated with the influence campaign. An FBI affidavit describes the domain seizures and a Russian state-backed effort to seed fake news stories to attack U.S. politicians supporting Ukraine in the war against Russia and stoke overall tensions in the U.S. Wednesday's announcements are the second major effort by the Biden administration to curb state-sponsored influence in recent months. On Thursday, Verizon announced it's acquiring Frontier Communications for $20 billion to expand its fiber network in the United States. I would benefit from this potentially, so I guess I'm kind of into this whole deal. Uh, The deal is expected to close in about 18 months, so it's not going to be tomorrow. Uh, It's going to be a while. Designed to help Verizon better compete against AT&T, T-Mobile, and others by enabling it to deliver premium broadband services. YouTube announced a new AI detection tool to protect creators, including artists, actors, musicians, and athletes from having their likeness copied and used in other videos. YouTube's existing content ID system will be expanded to include new synthetic singing identification technology to identify AI content that simulates someone's singing voice. Other detection technologies will be developed to identify when someone's face is simulated with AI. And next year, YouTube will begin to test the synthetic singing identification technology with its partners. Intel announced it no longer plans to use its own Intel 20A process node with its upcoming Arrow Lake processors for the consumer market going with external nodes instead, and possibly from its partner, TSMC. Earlier today, Tom caught up with Jen Briney from the Congressional Dish and We're Not Wrong podcasts to explain a little new wrinkle in the right to repair debate and where we are now. Seven U.S. states have right to repair laws, and 30 of them are considering either implementing them or extending them. But these almost all apply to consumer electronics, uh, requiring companies like Samsung or Apple to give you access to parts and manuals. So you can try to fix your own stuff if you want to. And a section of the Pending Defense Authorization Act wants to extend that right 
to the military. 404 Media did a report last week that manufacturers, many of whom aren't involved directly with the military, are opposing that section. And I could think of no one better than Jen Briney, who does this for a living, reading congressional bills uh, to join us from the Congressional Dish podcast. Thank you for doing this, Jen. Thanks for having me. So uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on here that the 404 is reporting on. Yeah, so um, the National Defense Authorization Act basically authorizes all of our war activities. And so this is a bill that becomes law every single year. And right now in the Senate version of that bill, there's a provision in there that would require contractors to essentially give the military all the knowledge and equipment that they would need to repair their own stuff. So there is a giant lobbying campaign happening right now to shut that provision down and trying to get it stripped out of the bill. And as you mentioned, Tom, there are a lot of manufacturing lobbying organizations that have nothing to do with the military that have joined this effort to kill this part of the Senate authorization or the Senate um, defense authorization. And the reason for that is that their big fear is actually not that provision that's related to the military. It are its other efforts that are happening right now in Congress, including the Repair Act and the Smart Act, that would apply the right to repair far more broadly to basically all consumer products. Because the real heart of this issue is that on the federal level, Section 12. Zero one of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that that part of that law prohibits circumvention of technical measures that control access to copyrighted work. It was basically all, but has been twisted by manufacturers to make that apply to physical property. Watching hearings about this, and there is a bipartisan to change that mistake because it was never intended to apply to things like tractors and automobiles. <laughs> and so they're twisting intellectual property to essentially get paid multiple times for buying your car, but then they can get paid over and over and over again by requiring you to go either to the manufacturer or their preferred partners. And so Congress is actually making an effort to change this. And that is what these manufacturing lobbies are so afraid of. Yeah, we've, we've talked on uh, the show before about John Deere, particularly uh, trying to claim there is a security uh, threat if you let farmers repair their own tractors and their own equipment. Uh, did, did you come across some of that in any of the hearings or testimony that you were oh, looking at? Absolutely. Um, there was, you know, they were making the comparison, like if you have two of these tractors and that take the engine that works and put it in the broken one to fix it, you have to send it to John Deere. Now, when it comes to tractors, that might not be a matter of life and death, right? Like you can wait a week to get your tractor back. But when you're talking about the military and having people out in a war zone, unable to fix the cars that they're riding in, the, the um, not Humvees, because they're getting rid of those, but there's a different kind of vehicle that this applies to. If you have to wait for Oshkosh contractors to fly <laughs> out to the Middle East to fix the vehicle that you need while getting shot at, that's a matter of life and death. So that is why right now the military is first on the list to have this taken care of. But they do see this as a problem more broadly because our food supply, like if your tractor is down when you're collecting food, that could spoil out in the field. So there are time limits to this. And there's a lot of parts of our economy that are being hit with unnecessary fees and unnecessary delays because of these lack of right to repair laws. Yeah, it does seem ironic that John Deere is claiming it's a security threat for you to be able to access your own software for repairs, when, as you described, there's also another security threat if you can't repair your stuff in a timely fashion. Uh, what is the sense you get on the momentum on this? Like the fact that it's bipartisan, I think, uh, indicates that it, it's got some good momentum towards passage. Uh, there's been a lot of momentum on the state level to get these things going. Going, as I mentioned at the top, uh, but it's, it sounds like this is the thin edge of the wedge and the manufacturers know it. If you can get it passed for the military, which has a security justification on the other end, maybe you can then get a federal law passed in the U.S. I do think. 
think that's the order that this is going to go in. Because like I said, the National Defense Authorization becomes law every single year. So the fact that there's a provision in chance. Unfor I mean, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword with the bills that would affect the rest of us because they have been written. So the SMART Act was written by a Democrat, the Repair Act written by a Republican. Good news. Listening to them in the hearings, they all seem to identify the problem child as Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So they're getting there. But the bad news is we're nearing the end of the Congress. All bills that are introduced in a Congress die at the end of a Congress, and the end of this Congress is the end of this year. And right now, those two bills that I just mentioned are only at the introduction phase, which means that they haven't moved at all. Mm. So I don't have a lot of hope for this Congress. But watching the conversations, the fact that this is not a partisan issue, I think if we demand it, we actually have a chance of getting this solved. I, I have learned by listening to Congressional Dish that the National Defense Authorization Act is a great way to just add stuff in that you want <laughs> because they have to pass it yeah. uh, or we don't have military. Is there a chance that they could expand that? Is that what the manufacturers are wor worried about, that they could just kind of shove in a, an act that applies to all of us? At this stage of the game, I don't think they're worried about that. I think they're worried about the slippery slope of having all of the states, as you mentioned. Um, you know, right now you can go to a car repair shop that is not affiliated with your dealer. And that's because Massachusetts made that a requirement in their law. And so it's affecting the rest of us countrywide. So they're afraid of any step in this direction. And so um, with the lobbying effort, with this one provision in the NDAA, I think there's enough resistance to that from the big money donors that I don't really expect anything amazing to get slipped into law, especially after an election. I always call the lame duck in an election year the most dangerous time of a Congress because mm. you've just fired a bunch of people. You're the furthest point away from the next point period of accountability, which is the election. So you don't tend to get a lot of consumer friendly favors after we have voted. Mm -hmm. This is the type of thing that we should start demanding for the next Congress if it's something that we want. Jen, thank you so much uh, for helping us understand this. I really appreciate that. Uh, if folks want to get more, I know you're you're talking about maybe doing more on this particular issue on Congressional Dish. How do they find yeah. it? Um, so the podcast is called Congressional Dish. It's found everywhere podcasts are found. And then you can also find my sources and everything on Congressional dish.com but i thank you for bringing this topic up because these hearings were fascinating so the um clips that i was referring to you can hear that in my next episode fantastic thanks jen and patrons you can hear an extended expanded conversation on this very topic with our producer amos you know amos he weighs in with his own experience repairing military equipment during his time in the u.s air force you can find it in your patreon feed or at patreon.com slash dtns and also, if you'd like to talk about Right to Repair or any other tech news of the day, you can do so by joining in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a patron account or linking your patron account over at patreon.com slash DTNS. Since we've got one of the hosts of Android Faithful on the show today, we're going to talk about some Android. And we're going to start off talking about what Google did Tuesday. They pushed the Android 15 source code to the Android Open Source Project. Launch of the latest Android OS will come to Pixel phones in October and select devices from partners in the coming months. So, so Ron, question for me. Um, if I remember correctly, the, the Pixel 9 came out two weeks ago. Correct. And the operating system to run on the Pixel 9 is not coming out for potentially another month. So that, well, that's, that's kind of odd. That's not I normally mean, how they do it, is it? line right here, and it's running Android 14. It's just not running Android 15, right? So, and it is, and it is very, this has been a weird summer. It's been a weird rollout uh, across the board. <laughs> um, and I, I do need to correct what you said. So, so um, uh, Android 15 is rumored to come to Pixel phones in October. Um, they have an official Google hasn't officially released the date when it will come rather just saying coming soon. Um, but leaks and speculation and insider chatter has us uh, leads us to believe it's going to be mid October when the pixels will get the devices, um, which w is more in line with how the pixel rollout has been in previous years. And that's really where the, the gotcha has been. Um, Google chose to roll out the new Pixel 9 uh, line of phones, which include the Pixel 9, Pixel 9 Pro, Pixel 9 Pro XL, and the Pixel 9 Pro Fold 
It's a lot of words in there. Um, they, they chose to roll that out in mid-August a couple of weeks ago at the Made by Google event that was held in uh, Mountain View, uh, as opposed to the October date that they've done historically. Uh, the past couple of years, they've had an event in New York City, and they've you know showed it off to press and to you know partners and things like that. Um, I was at the Made by Google event. There was a lot of I was talking to folks like Michael Fisher and uh, you know Mr. Mobile and and other you know kind of te tech folks, and we were all wondering why are we here in August. And the real only answer that we could all come up with was the fact that Google wanted to get the Pixel 9 phones and all of the wonderful AI inside of them uh, out ahead of Apple and the iPhone uh, announcement, which is, you know, you guys know better than I. It's, well, it's and that. Google wouldn't be, you know, that that's not the first time a company has been like, hmm, let's <laughs> creatively time our own announcement, you know, right. to, to get what we can out of something like this, right? It, Exactly. And so, but when you choose, when you make that decision that you want to launch the hardware earlier than the October is planned, the Android train, the Android trains yeah. running on this schedule that they've been on. They, they've Google's done a really good job with the Android oper operating system of creating a rinse and repeat yearly schedule with these Android um, uh, versions. It's, you know, under the, actually the, the great leadership, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Burke was the VP of engineering over at Google who oversaw Android for the last 10 plus years, whatever. He recently stepped, uh, stepped away from Android. He's taking on new projects in Google. Um, but him and his team, did a great job of getting, we knew like it was down to like within a week or two of each other year after year of when we would get, you know, the announcement of the new operating system, when the first beta hit, when the first developer preview hit, um, all these mm -hmm. kind of milestones that happened. And so there, that train was running on an October release, presumably to align with the release of the phones. But when the consumer products division and the, the powers that be at Google decide to, you know, get ahead of Apple and push, you know, pull back the release of the phones to earlier in August, there's nothing they can do. They couldn't get Android 15 on these devices um, because it hadn't been released yet. So, I mean, it it um, it surprises me a little bit that, um, you know, if we're talking about Google saying, all right, let you know, we know Apple's going to do their fall event. Let's get ahead of that. It's going to, you know, mess up some messaging, perhaps. But how much does the Android community, the people who are going to buy these phones, which is you know the whole point of all of this, yeah. how much do they care about an Apple event? That's, I mean, and but the other, that's a great question. And the other question to ask is, how much does this actually matter even to Android users, right? Because once Android 15 rolls out to the Pixel phones in mid October, and then rolls out to other car other manufacturers after that, life goes on. We move on. It is a confusing two month period that we're in, but for Android users, to, to folks like myself and Jason Howell and Michelle Rahman and, and Win Tua Dao, our other co hosts of Android Faithful, you know, of course, we're in it. We live and breathe it. My sister, who has a Pixel 7, who doesn't care about what her operating system is, doesn't care. Doesn't won't give won't give a, won't give a damn. As far as the <laughs> Apple event, Android users, we don't really care because it's not like it's not like I'm going to watch the Apple event and be like, you know, after all these years, Sarah, I'm going to jump and get an iPhone. Like, right. I, like, if, like if you were already thinking of getting, you know, the jumping operating systems, getting a new phone, then you would be interested. But right. the fact I, that it exists doesn't mean anything to but I do, you as I, a consumer. I do think Google is making a play in two directions. One is leading the AI charge in the Android space amongst all their partners and other manufacturers, of which Samsung is really the biggest kind of frenemy competitor pal that they have, right? Uh, Samsung, you know, is is rolling out all their own AI features. They touted that at the uh, Galaxy Unpacked event in July. Samsung's, uh, they just announced their developer conference uh, this fall, which is, you know, already themed around AI and what you can do on Samsung, stuff like that. So Google wants to lead in their circle of the Venn diagram. But then I think there's always the concern of there are people in the marketplace who don't care what phone they have and are going to buy a new one and might be deciding between a Pixel phone or an Android phone and an iPhone. And this is our chance to speak to them to say, hey, if you're one of those people and you're really into artificial intelligence, boosting the productivity of your phone, come look at us. To your point, Sarah, I don't know how big that audience actually is, right? but they, they got to try, I guess. Right. The, you know, because, you know, because yeah. when you look at the sales data, it's always iOS versus Android, and that's the market share number. And they're always trying to shift the 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 percentage over to Android. And that's they and 
there's a lot of stuff in Android 15 actually that helps moving to Android to make it even easier and better now. Um, and that's directly aimed at iPhone users. So, so what are some of the features that are going to be coming in Android 15? I know me per personally as a, uh, you know, as an Android user, I use a Galaxy device. I'm hoping that maybe I will get it on my phone sometime <laughs> <Yep>. this year. <laughs> but for those who will get it here in the next month or so, what can they expect? Well, yeah, and that, that's a that's an important note. So the rollout itself, they rolled out Android 15 to AOSP, which means that they rolled it out to the open source project so that other operating systems like uh, Lineage and Graphene and Calyx can start updating their operating systems, right? So those are the first people to get it. It's kind of like setting it off in the wild. Then next after that is going to be the Pixel users who are going to in October. And then sometime after that will be Samsung, OnePlus, the other partners, because they need to adapt their stuff and do their over-the-air updates. So, Rob, I would actually think on your Samsung phone, you're probably looking at like mid-November to get Android 15. That would be my guess. Um, in terms of what you can look forward to, part of why this all makes sense or this rollout makes sense is, is the fact that Android 15 is not a earth shattering update or release, at least in my point of view, there's a lot of stuff packed in there under the hood. Like the, the new feature set, it, the list is very, very long, but this isn't like years ago when they rolled out material design and it changed the way that we're, you know, interfacing with the operating system or some monu monumental change. Rather, there's a bunch of, of incremental additive, you know, subtle changes that improve the way the phones work that make some experiences a little better. But I mean, Sarah, to your point, I can't tell anyone like, hey, listen, you want to have the, the the newest, best phone experience. You got to get Android 15 because now you can do this. Right. It's, it's just not there. But um, yeah. A, yeah. a big, fe a big, but like you said, your sister is like, oh, yeah. my phone's great. You know, there are a lot of people. I mean, and again, like, there are way more Android people than iOS people, you know, if we're even making the comparison, which isn't even the point of this conversation, really. But right. So many, you know, so many folks who have nice phones say, yep. I don't know, it works. It's great. Yeah, um, exactly. There are those of us who are eagerly awaiting new features because we know they're coming. And right. then if they get delayed, we go, hmm, why were they delayed? You know, right. let's talk about that. But the, the vast majority of people don't care. Right. And, and again, I don't, I don't think any of these one features are enough to get someone to switch or switch over, but for an Android user, there's some awesome stuff under here. So like um, one of the features is called private space, which allows you to create a separate profile where you can, you can hide apps in, you kind of, you know, kind of, you know, when, you know, uh, box it away from, you know, if, and this is good if you, or sharing your phone, give it to your kids. You don't want them to get into your work email or whatever it might be. So having that ability to kind of push apps into a different area is helpful. Um, there's also um, a bunch of stuff around uh, connecting to devices. So they're adding support for virtual MIDI 2.0 devices. Um, you can, I didn't know if you know this, but you can actually use an Android phone as a webcam if you wanted to. If you hook it up via USB to your desktop um, and they've, they're have they introducing a high quality mode for that webcam access. Um, they're they're uh, revisiting the do not disturb pane and notifications to you know change the sensitivity of notifications. Um, a big thing also is uh, satellite connectivity. Now the modems are, are enabling satellite connectivity for SOS. Um, and down the road, we'll have satellite connectivity for messaging and things like that. Um, and then also they're doing a lot of UI stuff to accommodate for the explosion and foldables. Um, so, for example, uh, there's, you know, they're doing edge to edge apps by default. So app developers will de design apps to go completely to the full edge and not lose any space for the operating system. Uh, they also um, are have uh, better support for the cover screens on foldables um, and then just the, the overall continuity features on foldables to make sure that experience is controlled. Uh, also, one thing that I really like is a um, on larger devices like a tablet or a folded out foldable to have a taskbar at the bottom to, so you can access your recently used apps. Um, so little things like that, a collapsible volume panel um, you know, adaptive vibration controls, color contrast settings, you know, the list kind of goes on and on and they've got it over on the Android website. You can see every feature, but I mean, the, 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 the notes I have in front of me, I'm looking at is like a list of over 30 features, um, that again, 
aren't one to you know completely change the experience but if you're an android user it'll be an iterative update to make you appreciate the latest version that much more well and maybe all the more reason that <laughs> some people might be disappointed that they're waiting that much longer for this yep. because it's cool yeah. Um, one big change that I do think is funny um, is that with Android 15, now Google is officially changing the definition the definition of what fast charging means. Um, previously, fast charging worked with any uh, charging brick or charging device that charged uh, from 7.5 watts or higher. They're moving the goalpost on that to 20 watts or higher. So we're just redefining what fast means, which I think is it's more, more <laughs> language than technology right there. Yeah. But so... <laughs> Uh, well, Ron, thank you so much for walking us through some of the stuff. Um, I know we could talk about Android 15 all day and, uh, you'll be with us in good day internet afterwards, uh, to talk a little bit more about all the stuff, but, uh, before we wrap up DTNS, let's check out the mailbag. AI Tammy Charles wrote in, and this is in response to our conversation about Canva uh, increasing pricing for certain tiers quite a bit. AI Tammy Charles writes in, I don't understand what you can do in Canva that you couldn't do with the PowerPoint or PowerPoint-like office software. Could someone enlighten me? And, Ron? Yeah, I mean, I use Canva. <laughs> I, I, I have used Canva. I won't say that I use Canva. Uh, over PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever. There is a world I want to live in where I use a Chromebook and I use all web-based apps and have no, like I don't have Photoshop, I don't have PowerPoint or anything like that because like the cloud, the commitment to the cloud and all that sort of stuff is kind of like supposed to be the dream. And I'm, you know, I'm old now and I find myself tethered to this concept of desktop apps and a native app for the operating system being more powerful than a web app. And I will give Canva credit and the work that Adobe's done with Photoshop on the web and stuff like that is that they've really bridged the gap between what a desktop app can do and what a web app can do. I did a whole media kit for Android Faithful uh, purely in Canva, um, whereas previously I would have done it in PowerPoint. And I did it purely as like an exercise to see if I could. I could. I think it took me about twice as long because I wanted to pull my hair out because I've got about 25 years of PowerPoint under my belt where, uh, you know, I just, I, it's native and I, I can feel it. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, it, it's just another, another step in the direction of not needing to buy and install a piece of software and be able to use something on the web. That's, that's the biggest value I see. So I could do that anywhere, whether I'm in the airport, at home, in the office, on the train, whatever, I can access my designs and update them and not have to worry about, oh, it's on my desktop. I've got PowerPoint installed. I don't have it on my laptop or whatnot. So. I use Canva all the time it just it just makes life easier i use it on my tablet i've got a nice pixel eight um you know eight plus i use it on there all the time i don't know that i'd be willing to pay 300 percent more for it if i had like a uh you know if i had a uh a business account but uh but i do use it all the time and i, I think you hit the nail right on the head it's 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 a web app and you can do all these wonderful things with it yeah I mean, yeah, I'm I mean, I, I think the the you know the conversation we had yesterday was mostly about you know is Canva doing the right thing by hiking up the prices so much for certain teams, but also saying we're doing this, but we're also giving you new features. Some people yeah. are going to use those features. Other people say, well, we didn't ask for them, so we don't want price increases. But just you know, goes to show you that you do have options. And that's such as progress, and everyone raises their prices at some point. Indeed. Yeah. Um, uh, well, Ron Richards, um, uh, your price is whatever you want it to be because we love to have you on in. the show. <laughs> it's locked <laughs> right? in. Sarah, you At got all me. times. Yeah. Good, good. Ten years. Ten yep. years. Okay. <laughs> We're not going to go any uh, anything beyond that. But let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of what you do. Yeah, so you can follow me on social media. I'm at RonXO across all different platforms. I'm most active on Instagram, so you can check that out. Um, but but please do check out Android Faithful over at AndroidFaithful.com. Uh, podcast comes out every Tuesday. We live stream here on the D Daily Tech News Show um, YouTube and Twitch channel and Good Day Internet uh, Twitch channels. Um, and the podcast releases on RSS uh, that Tuesday night. Uh, and we, we're posting articles to the website. We're covering the stuff as they keep throwing it at us, and we try to cover it. So please check it out. Uh, and thanks you to everybody who has checked it out. It's been, we're a little over a year old and we couldn't be here without DTNS. So thank you everybody. 
And patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. New drones are coming out all the time. We'll talk about DJI's latest, and Rob might be about to have a little accident uh, right past you <laughs> getting one of these things because it looks kind of awesome. <laughs> Reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back doing it all again tomorrow, talking Sonos updates. Ooh, Sonos has been in the news lately with Patrick Norton joining us. He's got thoughts. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>